Father, we are grateful for the blessing that we have to be in your kingdom, to be your children. Father, to know that you are with us and that you uh, walk th through this world with us at all times and that we can seek your comfort, your guidance, uh, and your encouragement during the difficult experiences that are part of this life. And also, Father, that we can rejoice with you and offer praises for all that uh, you have done for us and to be thankful for the kindnesses that we receive because of your merciful and gracious heart. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the uh, blessings that are ours because he came to this world on flesh, uh, endured uh, suffering as a perfect uh, the perfect lamb of God, and uh, gave his life in order to provide forgiveness for us. We're thankful, Father, that you've given us your kingdom, that we have a spiritual family as well as a citizenship in heaven, that we can be uh, of support to one another as we uh, seek to be the light wherever we go. We ask, Father, for strength and for wisdom. Uh, to be able to find opportunities to turn people to you and to cause them uh, to understand the hope that they can have in your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for everyone here tonight, uh, for all those who uh, in your kingdom are studying the world, studying the Bible around the world. We pray that your kingdom will be strengthened by the word, and Father, that we will have uh, guidance in a practical and objective way for the decisions that we make. Thank you, Father, for your love. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, if you want to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians, we'll be looking um, at the first few verses in, in chapter 1. Uh, in our outline, uh, the, the section that um, we're looking at uh, now is the discussion of the Corinthians' response to Paul's first letter. Um, that would be chapters 1 through 7, and we'll be looking at verses in chapter 1 tonight. The second section is the collection of money for Judean Christians. That's chapters 8 and 9. Uh, and the final section is uh, the vindication of Paul's apostolic authority, that he um, has the authority to speak as an apostle. Uh, we'll look at that in chapters 10 through 13. Uh, some of you asked uh, last time, uh, for uh, a review of the number of letters that Paul uh, wrote to the church at Corinth. Well, we know of at least four. Uh, there could be others that are not mentioned, but the first letter that he wrote, we don't have a record of. However, we have a mention of it in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9, because Paul wrote, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. So he wrote them a letter about um, their moral and, and ethical codes, uh, and that letter we don't have. The second letter that we have is what we call 1 Corinthians. The third letter, uh, this Paul calls a tearful or severe letter. Uh, when he writes in 2 Corinthians 2, 3 through 4, he said, I wrote... Uh, you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. So that was the third letter. We don't have that one either. The fourth letter is the letter that we call 2 Corinthians. So we know there were at least four letters, and also Paul made several journeys there, some quick and some short, uh, whereas the others uh, took a little more time, and he spent time with them teaching them the Word of God. The reason that this letter was written uh, is to explain his service to God as an apostle, uh, and how that was applied in his ministry and his service in Corinth, and to discuss the letters that he wrote. There were misunderstandings about Paul's plans to visit the congregation uh, and the reason for sending letters, and evidently uh, there were false teachers there who were trying to stir up trouble, create that doubt, and divide the church that they might uh, have an advantage over Paul's influence in that congregation. And so Paul is concerned because these are people whom he knows and loves. And so he responds to their criticisms uh, in, in 1 Corinthians and also in 2 Corinthians. We'll find here uh, in the last uh, uh, chapters, 10 through 13, 
some of the specific and hostile things that they were saying about him. So as we go through the first seven chapters, even the first nine, you'll find that Paul has a very kind and, and gracious and pleasant tone. But when he gets to the false teachers and the danger they are to the salvation of the church at Corinth, he becomes, becomes very strict and uh, sometimes severe in the warnings that he makes concerning the danger they're bringing to the church there. Uh, so what we're going to look at uh, today uh, is Paul's foundation of gratitude. Uh, why is he gratitude? Gra why is he grateful uh, to God? What is his gratitude based on? That's in verses three and four. Here the apostle Paul writes, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. So we, we learn at the beginning here, uh, when Paul speaks of, uh, of blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that he has identified the Father for praise. Paul uses a Greek word here, eulogetos, which uh, uh, translated blessed, is used exclusively of God. The word means one who is inherently worthy to be praised. And so naturally, it would speak of the Father. And we find in Romans chapter 9, verse 5, that it is used to describe Christ. So God is to be praised. He's inherently worthy to be praised. Why? And this is what Paul gets in, into as he speaks in the rest of verses 3 and 4. First of all, he says that he is the God and Father of our Lord. Paul's emphasis on God's fatherhood here points to God's um, role in the salvation uh, of mankind and the, the place that Jesus played in that role. For Jesus is his only begotten son, that is, his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. And yet, because of the need to rescue us, uh, God had to watch uh, with some suffering himself that his son was innocently uh, fought against, uh, beaten, persecuted, and ultimately uh, died a very unpleasant death. It points to God's dramatic rescue of, of, of Christ by resurrecting him from the dead and exalting him to the Father's side. So when he starts out by looking at uh, our God, the Father of our Lord, um, he's pointing at the cost and the suffering that the Father uh, paid and gave in order to rescue us. This gives us some indication uh, of what we might expect from the Son as, as well. It's important to remember that the Christ, the Messiah, um, on whom uh, the, the text points here, um, suffered innocently, and he died an excruciating death, uh, in spite of the fact that he lived perfectly and that people could bring no le legitimate uh, charge against him. So we learn in the life uh, of, of Christ uh, the value of suffering and how God uh, ultimately comforts. And we're looking at both the Father and the Son uh, to help us understand how we live in this world. And because the Father was able to rescue his Son uh, from uh, death, he's also able to, to rescue us. So the comfort uh, begins with understanding who the Father is, his relationship to the Son, and what the Son has done in relationship to us. There we see evidence uh, of what he calls here uh, our, our merciful uh, Father, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The word that we have here for comfort is made up of two words, uh, to come alongside, para, alongside of, uh, and, to, and to call into one's presence. Uh, it's the word that we hear of this paraclesis, and that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are paracleto. That means um, that they bring something alongside as we walk through this world. We don't walk alone. 
but we have the Spirit, we have the Son, and we have the Father who come alongside us and provide comfort. But it's not uh, simply a soothing sympathy that somebody uh, might expect. It has the idea of strengthening us, of helping us, of making us strong. In fact, uh, the idea behind the word is communicated by a word in Latin, uh, fortis, which also means strong. So it's not just a soothing, it's a coming alongside to provide strength, to provide help, uh, and to give encouragement. Paul considers um, this a characteristic of the Father. We find in John chapter 14, verse 6, verse 26, John chapter 15, verse uh, 26, that the Holy Spirit is described as that one who also comes along uh, to help us. And so God in every aspect, whether the Father, whether the Son, whether the Holy Spirit, is full of comfort, strength, and help. And Paul brings this out by the word that he uses to describe God and by emphasizing um, that the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ uh, are the source of mercies and all comfort. This is an important picture uh, that Paul is drawing in order to help those who serve in God's kingdom to understand what God does for those who minister. If you get involved in, in the kingdom of God, there's always going to be the potential uh, for discouragement, the potential uh, for people to disagree and contradict and for divisions to occur. Of course, we uh, hope this doesn't ha happen and we encourage and teach towards that end. But if you become a deacon or an elder or a minister or a teacher, you're going to find that there are some people um, who are going to either be offended uh, or in some way unhappy uh, with your teaching. And as a minister of Christ in any capacity, you have an opportunity to turn to him because he understands. He's been there. He's been there in the most severe way. Uh, and he gives comfort to us understanding our weaknesses and understanding the challenge that comes uh, in serving in God's kingdom. And the Apostle Paul, of course, will use himself as an example, because in spite of the fact that he did exactly what Christ asked him to do, in spite of the fact that he consistently sought to save the lives of any people uh, he came in contact with, he had enemies. And sadly, he had enemies within the church at Corinth, uh, who perhaps did not originate there, but came there uh, when he was gone and influenced people uh, to turn away from him. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter where we are, what kind of uh, service we're doing, there will be difficulty, there will be su suffering. But no matter what it is, God, according to his mercy and power, will comfort us. He will come alongside us through his spirit uh, and through his word. And Jesus, of course, is the word as well. And he will show us comfort. Now, one of the things we, we need to be prepared for is that when God comes alongside us as our comforter, he doesn't necessarily, necessarily come to fix something. Uh, I, I like somehow when I have a problem on my computer and I go to the software company that wrote the program that's causing problems, and you can just click on a button that says, fix it. You don't have to understand. You, know, you don't have to do a lot of reading or research. don't have to download anything. Click on fix it. And suddenly the problem is gone. Well, that's the goal. Uh, sometimes I'm suspicious of fix it. But in this particular case, we need to be suspicious that just because we're uncomfortable or just because we're suffering uh, in the ministry of work of Christ, doesn't mean that God is going to, to take that away immediately and fix it, perhaps in the way that we think or in the way that we hope, because there's a reason uh, that we face these difficulties, these circumstances that uh, might even be classified as evil. Uh, we don't face it alone. We face it with God. But there's some, some value 
uh, into an, in enduring and persevering in the difficulties that, that come to us. Uh, Paul wants the church in Corinth, as well as us today, to know that God will assist us, he will help us, and he will strengthen us. He will stand by our side because he is capable. He is all-powerful, and he understands the difficulties that we face. But we trust him, knowing that at the right time and at the right moment, the solution that he's providing and the comfort that he's uh, offering will become evident uh, to us. I would like to stop here at this particular point and, uh, and show you um, a PowerPoint of some of the purposes of suffering that will help us to understand uh, what Paul is saying here. So I'm going to go to share, uh, and I'm going to find the text that is going to help us, I hope, and I will share that. Okay, so here we are. Uh, 2 Corinthians, the purpose of suffering. If for some reason you would like a copy of this uh, paper, just put a, a note in the chat saying you would like it. I'll email it to you. Uh, or if you uh, would like, um, I can actually email it to, to everybody when I send out the notification uh, that it has been, uh, the video has been posted. But we'll start with this, and later on, if people are interested, I'll mail it, email it to you, uh, and you can take a look at it. First of all, suffering in the context of the difficulties that are part of ministry relationships and that we, that we do in, in Christ's name need to be prepared for because they will happen. Uh, I remember one time when I was preaching and uh, at the very beginning, there were so many helpful people. One brother would stand in the back of the auditorium and uh, if I didn't speak loudly enough or if something was going wrong, he would give me hand signals and, and tell me what to do. And it was very comforting and encouraging to know that he was there. But there was also a sister in Christ who got little crossways with me. And one time I did a lesson on um, integrity in, in Christ. And she said, that's a great lesson. Too bad you don't practice it as she turned and went out the door. Uh, and so, you know, you get a few of those in a row and you, you realize, okay, I need to improve. But you also consider in the back of your mind, tomorrow's Monday, maybe I should resign. Uh, and so Monday is usually not a great day for preachers. Uh, not always the case, but uh, that's the time that we have to reflect on what's gone on in the ministry in our lives. So the purpose of suffering connects to all people, whether it's in ministry or it's outside of ministry. There's some value in it or God would not allow it. The first reason is that we need to, the first principle we need to study is that trouble is inescapable. It's not something that we can avoid because the world uh, is fallen. The, the sin that has come into the world makes many things evil and that evil impacts us. Uh, and I have often said, don't uh, don't worry about the uh, evil and, and suffering. It's got GPS. It's going to find you. Uh, and it does. And remember in Job chapter 5, uh, the, the message there, man is born for trouble. Uh, that may be a, a kind of a pessimistic view. It doesn't mean it has to be our view when we get up in the morning, because we can rejoice uh, in spite of the difficulty, by knowing that God is in, in control and trusting that he is involved in helping us uh, to find our way through this world. But Job 14 verse 1 said, uh, briefly, man is short-lived lived and full of turmoil. Um, that is uh, sad and almost humorous uh, in the fact that it can be true. We don't live a long time, but we can uh, experience uh, a great deal of turmoil. It doesn't have to be this way, and how we respond to it uh, can determine whether or not we rejoice. In Jeremiah 20, verse 18, uh, Jeremiah writes, why did I ever come forth from the, the womb to look on trouble and sorrow? Uh, this is a, uh, an experience that 
most people have at some time in their life. Not exactly those words maybe, uh, but perhaps they will find themselves in the midst of a particular situation uh, where they really struggle. Uh, and I wonder, you know, what is the point of life? That's the value and understanding what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians, and also understanding a number of other verses, including the letter to Philippians, the letter to the Romans, uh, both of which give us an idea on how to see the value uh, of these challenges. That's the first thing to consider. Trouble is uh, an inescapable uh, reality. Oops, got to get back to my, there. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. Second of all, adding to the pain of trouble is the disturbing reality that God sometimes seems distant and unconcerned. Job said, why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? In Psalm 10 verse 1, the psalmist said, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? This is uh, unfortunately, a reality in this life. Uh, our timing uh, is looking for instantaneous end of suffering and difficulty, looking for an immediate solution. And sometimes the value that comes from the suffering and the difficulties that we face requires some time. And so going through that period of time, we may be wondering, uh, why isn't God answering me? Why is he not listening uh, to my request? Request. We can be sure that he is. There may be a need for some time uh, to pass in order for the benefit or the purpose of the suffering to become known to us and to provide that benefit. So let's take a look at, at, uh, at eight uh, purposes for suffering. Starting number one, God allows bad things to happen to his people to test the validity of their faith. In Proverbs 17, verse 3, the wise man says, uh, quite literally, the Lord tests the hearts. So God provides a situation, not a temptation, but a test in order to test us and to help us uh, to know where we are. You can tell the difference in, in the New Testament between a test and a temptation because it's the same Greek word. There's only one Greek word, but you can tell in the context whether it's a test or a temptation because a test is designed to benefit us. A temptation is designed to defeat us. And so temptation comes from Satan. Uh, God does not tempt us, James tells us in James chapter 1. But the Lord does test us. Uh, and this testing uh, helps us to see and helps him to provide opportunities for us to grow where we are weak. Some of you uh, maybe learned to, to touch type when you were in high school. When I was in high school and they said, you need to take a course in typing, I thought, I don't want to. And so I didn't. And of course, as soon as I got into university, I said, well, was that a big mistake? Um, because handwriting was not possible and testing by the Hunt and Peck method was time consuming. And so I got this program uh, eventually uh, on my computer called Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing. And what Mavis Beacon did was help me to learn where my fingers needed to be and which key was associated with what finger without looking. And Mavis Beacon would test my skills along the way and make a game after it was all over based on the mistakes that I had done. And the game called for the use of my fingers in order to win the game. And those fingers that especially I had problems with uh, were tested and improved. And I could uh, tell you that after 20 minutes a day for uh, a few weeks, I was able to touch type without lurking, looking. And this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Tests are designed to improve us. Uh, and to, to help us to know where we are. Temptations are designed by Satan to defeat us. And so God allows bad things to happen to his people uh, so that he can test the validity of our faith. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 1, uh, we have a situation with 
uh, Hezekiah. Uh, and the text says, in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that happened in the land, God left him alone only to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Uh, and, and so Hezekiah might have liked a little help in the very beginning uh, when these uh, people came uh, from Babylon to inquire. But the text said God uh, left him alone to test him, uh, to know what was in his heart. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, that we face, but we, we will be encouraged by if we realize that God gives us a test designed uh, to improve us, to help us to grow, and to understand our relationship with him. First Peter 1, uh, 6 through 7, actually, if you go back to verse 3, um, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, this is the same idea we're seeing in 2 Corinthians, according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation uh, ready to be revealed uh, in the last time. And so we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. The power of God is active in our lives. Uh, that is the blessing that we have from our God who is called blessed here in 1 Peter chapter 1. He is inherently uh, uh, blessed. Uh, his great mercy in verse 6, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Here is the challenge. Uh, we can greatly rejoice when we understand who God is and how he's working in our life and the power that is ours to help us eventually get through the test. But he says, you may, it may be necessary that you are distressed um, by the various trials at first, and this will happen. Uh, the distress and the pressure uh, has a number of effects that we'll see later, but this is what can uh, help us to come to Christ. And so in verse 7, he says, so that the proof, proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some people will have a test unto death, okay? That's the way it is with some of the, the heroes of faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. Some of them died, and some of them we don't have the names of them, but they were sawn in two. And yet they remained faithful to God, even to death. Uh, this is an encouragement to us if we find ourselves in a difficulty, knowing that there are others who have gone before us uh, who were successful in a test, even a test uh, unto death. The, the second one uh, says God allows bad things to happen to his people to wean them from the world. That's an interesting uh, idea because you'll remember in Hebrews, um, the Hebrew writer says that, that Christians can be stuck on the milk of the word rather than growing and being stronger and able to handle deeper and significant uh, principles, they're stuck on the basics. Well, um, bad things can challenge us uh, to not get connected to the world in that way. John chapter 6, 5 through 9, is the record of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, you'll remember there, it says in verse 5, therefore Jesus, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? And some people may think Jesus didn't have an idea. Jesus didn't have a plan. Well, the text says, of course he did, verse 6. This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. And sometimes this is what a rabbi or a teacher does. He presents a challenge 
to a student or to a follower to see if they've appreciated or understood the principles that have already been taught. And so Jesus knew that he was going uh, to feed the 5,000. He was going to do a miracle, but he's wanting his 12 disciples in a controlled and safe environment to have a test to see if they knew what to do. And the solution, as it often was, is to turn to Jesus and ask for his help. Uh, later on, he would be gone from them and not there in person, and they would ask through prayer. So the second principle is God allows things to happen to his people, bad things, in order to wean them from the world. Rather than seeing only the solutions that the world offers, we need to turn to God and to find those solutions which he provides. The third uh, reason for suffering, God allows bad things to happen to his people to call them uh, to their heavenly hope. In Romans chapter five, verses three and five, uh, if, you've read the, if you've read Ken's book on the joy principle, you know this is the key verse uh, and understand the principle, understanding the principle of, of joy. Uh, if you haven't read his book, go ahead and read it because we're going to be preaching on Philippians and you'll get a lot of encouragement from that particular book and we hope to reinforce it, uh, Gene and I do in our sermons. But in Romans chapter 5, 3 through 5, he says, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Uh, and so Paul says here, we exult in our tribulations. Now, this is going to be a challenge because normally we get into pity parties, not in exaltation parties. When, when something difficult happens to us, it's not our natural human uh, response to, to rejoice, but we can under the circumstances that he gives here. First of all, the word tribulation comes for the word that they use to press the juice out of grapes. They would put the grapes in a, a low place uh, and they would go out there barefooted and press the, the, the grapes until the juice came out. And so he's saying situations will come to us pressing situations that cause that kind of pressure, but we can exalt how? Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. If we understand that we will learn to endure, this is James chapter one, starting in verse one, all the way down to verse five, he's talking about facing the tests and the trials in this world with joy, because we know that God uh, is going to bring out a positive result. And the process is experience tribulation, learn to persevere, develop proven character, and then have hope. People without hope uh, in this world, and we see them all over the news and all over the internet, are people who are, are not learning uh, how to make the right response in tribulation. Difficulty comes and they want an immediate solution. There's no stopping to know and to think logically and to reason. This difficulty is giving me strength to persevere. And once, one, once I have strength to persevere, I am prepared in my character for difficulties that will come into my life later. And then, when I face those difficulties, I will have hope. I will know that there is a solution. Uh, and so he says, we're not disappointed with this kind of hope because we see that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit uh, who's been given to us. So turn to God, uh, seek his wisdom. He says, pray and ask if you're not figuring out how to get to trials and difficulties. And he is gracious and generous to give us. He doesn't hold uh, grudges. He doesn't complain. He gives you generously in answer to your request, and then we can find joy. We are able to exult. We will not be disappointed in this life if we follow the wisdom that Paul has given us here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the very book we're studying, later on we'll get 
uh, into this idea. He describes it this way in verse 17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. In a nutshell, he's saying the suffering in this life is really short when you compare it to eternity. Eternity is forever. Uh, and the price of enduring here for the, the, the comparably shorter time is a small price. And we don't do it alone. Uh, he says in verse verse. 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We look to Christ who is not seen. And we know that he went before us and suffered all things and went before us and was victorious. God raised him from the dead and his power is now available for us. And so if we will look to the unseen, if we will look to those heroes of faith, if we will look to Christ and know there is a world beyond the visible, and that's our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's not in this country uh, first. We are, are, are children and citizens of the kingdom. All empires go away. All empires collapse. And some of them God crushes because of their sinfulness. But we are not citizens here. Our hope is in another unseen land. So that's the third uh, uh, reason that God allows uh, bad things to happen. The fourth is that he reveals to his people uh, what they really love, or uh, you might say what they really should love. Uh, in Genesis chapter 21, 1 uh, through uh, two, you have God giving Abraham a son. So it says God gave Abraham a son. And then uh, uh, later on, uh, this is a fairly long passage. If you read the, the context, uh, he gives him a son. And then later in chapter 22, one through two, uh, this uh, uh, only son that he had through his, his wife, uh, the one who through whom the, all nations would be less, blessed, he then calls upon him uh, to sacrifice. And so uh, this thing that seems bad on the surface um, helped to reveal to God and to Abraham where uh, Abraham's true love was. Was he so uh, connected to this son who was the son of promise in his old age? Uh, was he so... Um, um, in love with him that he would uh, contradict or go against a direct command of God. And Abraham showed that he would not contradict the commandment of God. And he trusted that however it was going to work out, that God would do it because God was in control. And of course, God did. Uh, God provided the ram that would uh, be sacrificed in, instead of uh, uh, Abraham sacrificing his son. So, so this uh, bad thing helped to reveal uh, to Abraham where his true love was. And it also gives us an opportunity um, because we can read about it and find in him uh, the same kind of a benefit. Number six, God allows bad things to happen to his people so he can re reveal his compassion to them. Uh, in Isaiah uh, 49, um, Isaiah writes, Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth in joyful shouting, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on the afflicted. Notice the key word there at the end. The nation of Israel was afflicted. But it says that God will have compassion on his afflicted. And so he's telling them, Isaiah is, to shout for joy uh, and, and to rejoice. And he's speaking to the heavens and to the earth uh, and to all of those who are God's people uh, to, to know that God is going to comfort his people and he will have compassion on his afflicted. And so we can shout for joy. We can shout for joy because we know what the heavens know, what the earth knows, what the mountains know, that God has all power 
and that he cares for us. And that power uh, will result in his showing compassion. He will not let the end be bad, even if we don't make it uh, in the way that the world calls success in this world, we will make it to that kingdom that he's promised us and that citizenship, which is ours for eternity in heaven. So believers never know God more intimately than we, when he comforts them uh, in their suffering. And that's what we can learn as well. Number seven, God allows bad, allows bad things to happen to his people to strengthen them for greater usefulness. Um, we see something similar in, uh, in James chapter 1, 2 through 4 that I referred to uh, several times before. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that you, the, the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. And so the emphasis here uh, is that uh, by going through this suffering, this test, this trial, we are strengthened and we will find ourselves more useful to God, uh, more useful, in fact, to the lost, uh, as well as the saved, because we gain the strength that we need uh, to, to in, endure. We are refined by trials, the same as, as gold is refined um, by heat. One of the things I observed as I worked uh, in Slovakia uh, was how I was surprised, shouldn't have been, that the difficulties and challenges I faced uh, while serving uh, as a preacher in the United States, prepared me in very specific ways for things that I would face in Slovakia. I didn't look at it that way. I had no idea that that's how it was going to turn out because I didn't know I would be going anywhere uh, other than uh, preaching in, in the United States. But this is the key. The key is we become more useful. Now, we see that, of course, uh, and, and just uh, not necessarily the spiritual uh, usefulness that we gain, but, but in anything where suffering leads to strength and, and greater usefulness. Look at number eight. God allows bad things to happen to his people to enable them to comfort others uh, in their trials. Because God the Father has experienced suffering, because Jesus Christ has experienced suffering, suffering because we have ca we've caused the Holy Spirit to be grieved. These are things that they can understand, and God the Father, especially uh, through his son Jesus, who became a man. Uh, we can, uh, in the same way, uh, be prepared, learn skills, find opportunities to comfort people who are facing uh, the same or similar trials that we have faced. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 32, uh, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, he says, Simon, Simon, be Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And so this is a request much like when Satan uh, in the book of Job went before the father and asked for permission, basically, uh, to cause Job to suffer. Uh, Satan wanted permission uh, to sift Simon like wheat. Uh, Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when, once you have turned again, will strengthen your brothers. Now, pay attention that Jesus didn't pray that the challenge would be taken away, that the suffering would be taken away. He didn't pray for that. He prayed that he might have the strength uh, and faith not to fail. Uh, and then he would be prepared with that strength, strength to strengthen your brothers. In verse 33, um, but he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Peter was sincere in what he said, um, but he wasn't aware 
uh, of how the, the, the sifting of Satan would affect his immediate behavior. And in verse 34, he said, uh, Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will crow, uh, not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. So Peter faced his suffering, his sifting like wheat. Satan challenged him, and Peter uh, had a difficulty uh, and failed the immediate uh, test of not of, of disowning uh, Jesus. But he learned from that. We know, of course, towards the end of the gospel that he came back to Jesus, and Jesus tested him again three times by asking him, uh, if he loved Jesus. And we see there three times he did, uh, even though uh, his uh, first to two responses were uh, more on the brotherly kind of love. We do know that, that Peter then became someone who could encourage others. And that's the message of circuit. first and second Peter. He has encouraged them in the, fa in, in the face of difficulties and in the, in the uh, sifting of Satan to not give up. He knew firsthand what the challenge was. And so this is what point or, or, or number eight is, that God allows bad things to happen to his people uh, to enable them to comfort others. Uh, looking at number nine, oh, excuse me, number eight. Number nine uh, is coming back to the word, coming back to, to chapter uh, one of First Corinthian, Corinthians and realizing uh, that we have in advance been given knowledge about who the God is that walks with us. Who is it that comes along and gives us strength? We have his word uh, that will comfort us and we uh, have uh, our servants. For example, uh, in Psalm 46, verse 1, we find that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. So his presence is with us, and he gives us comfort uh, in the face of these uh, challenges that bring suffering. We also receive um, comfort through his word. In Romans 15, verse 4, um, Paul writes, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So suffering comes to us. We, we see these eight uh, uh, benefits that come from this uh, suffering. But in the midst of the suffering, God doesn't leave us alone. Uh, he comes in his presence to comfort us through the Holy Spirit. Psalm 46, verse 1. He comforts us through his word. Second Thessalonians adds to this. Chapter 4, 16 uh, through 18, the words Paul, Paul him, uh, of Paul himself get, that were given via the Holy Spirit were a comfort. He says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise uh, first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul says, share my words uh, that are from the Holy Spirit with other people so that you might find comfort in this difficult time and not worry that God uh, has not got a plan to rescue us out of this world. So his presence, his word, and also his servants. In 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7, we'll see later, uh, uh, Paul writes, For even when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God who comforts the depressed comfort us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, and so that I rejoiced even more. So Paul, when he was worried what was happening with Corinth, how are they responding to uh, his letter, he's 
uh, Titus he couldn't find. He's worried about Titus. Then Titus comes and encourages him. And not only does Titus encourage him by his presence and his safety, but he encourages him by the message that he brought uh, of how the majority of the people in Corinth had accepted Paul's first letter. letter. So what I want you to see in, in this uh, introduction uh, to the comfort of God, is that there is a reason for the suffering, for the difficulties, for the trials and tests that come uh, in this life. Uh, from God, they are designed to help us. From God, they give us strength to prepare for the future. They give us an opportunity to rejoice because we know God is in charge and what he's doing for us is going to, in, in fact, give us strength. So that's our, our lesson for tonight, uh, a lesson on finding hope uh, and the challenges that we face and knowing that God is here to comfort us. That's one of the key ideas uh, in the letter that Paul wrote, the second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, if you would uh, close with me now, let's end our prayer and then we'll turn the requests over to Jean. Father, we thank you so much for your loving us, for your blessing us uh, through this message that Paul has written to the church at Corinth. Father, we're so grateful that you are merciful. Uh, we're so grateful that your power is available to us. We're so grateful that your son Jesus came here uh, and lived and showed us how we can walk in this world, and especially for us to see how great is your love, that you would give your only begotten son to die in our place. Father, we Thank you for Paul's writing that helps us to understand uh, that, that uh, Jesus is suffering, uh, though painful beyond our understanding, uh, did not last, but he was rescued uh, and brought to be with you in heaven and that he encourages us. He understands us and he's our advocate uh, before you and against Satan. And we thank you for that and for the hope that we have in the friends that are ours in your kingdom, for the people who encourage us and for the people that we encourage. Thank you, Father, for your love and for this message that we've had today. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.